So for our MLK Day of Service, we wanted to start out with um, our version of reflecting on the dream, and that's Dr. King's dream, Dr. King's vision for equality, for social justice, um, to for everybody to come together for the common good. We had some youth poets there. We have uh, Reverend Parker, State Representative Donna Dukes, and we had Theater Action Project. We had the Houston Tillotson Choir. The volunteers, basically, they were families. They were uh, young people, college age, they were older, and they came from across um, Central Texas. In reading Dr. King's writings, he said on more than one occasion that what drove him were the burnings of his own heart. What is it that stirs your heart today? And can the fire be made contagious? Sai fora! I have a dream that one day we will all have a dream that we will soon live in peaceful paradise, painting pictures of perfection. And we will no longer have the slave to pay our dues and these dreams we share will become like deja vu, you see, I have a dream. Dr. King's dream of community was more than just a day off of the holiday, but about every day being on. The theme this morning, strengthening communities through meaningful volunteer action. It's about organizations working together to make for a better community, make for a better world. I will say for myself and for United Way who I represent, Martin Luther King gives me the strength to offer a vision here to this community. And that vision is that we must engage ourselves, we must be united, in order to make sure that everyone in our community has the opportunity to succeed. The question is, will you be a servant? Dr. King said that life's most urgent question is, what are you doing for others? We are marching in the lights of God. 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 Dr. King is a hero of mine because, I mean, great words, great ins inspiration for me is everybody be everybody can be great because everybody can serve. What is a docu-blogger? A docu-blogger is a creative individual that not only enjoys watching stories about their community, they enjoy telling them as well. Whether they're sharing their opinions through a blog or grabbing a camera and documenting the story as it unfolds, docu-bloggers can find a home at klru.org slash docu-bloggers. We invite you to join us in creating and enjoying stories about life in Central Texas. Firing up and get ready to go. Firing them up and getting ready to go. How do you spell relief today? O B A M A O B A M A O B A M A Obama is his name. It's hard to ignore the commotion surrounding the 2008 presidential election. We are standing as a country at the precipice of historic and uncertain times. The end of a two term presidency, a lingering and unpopular war, the threat of recession, and the candidacies of the democratic race seem to be combining into a perfect storm, invigorating the public like no election in recent memory. This is a once-in-a-lifetime -life op opportunity for our son to see the importance of politics and to realize that, uh, you know, that it is very important to get out and vote and be active in your community because you do have a voice. 
The DocuBloggers team found ourselves bearing witness to one of the more pivotal moments in this election year. The much-anticipated debate in Austin between Democratic candidates Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama on February 21st. There we are in the spin room after the debate. For those of you not completely submerged in political wonkery, the spin room is the place where the campaign teams go to tip the contest in favor of their candidate. There is no disputing that Barack Obama is the person who is being followed. He has the greatest followership, which demonstrates that he has a large leadership. I think, you know, she came out very strong, even when you look at the very specifics that she has about health care, and especially the last answer, you could see that she's very passionate about the issues are important. They are similar in a lot of, of issues. They have similar positions, but I really like his position today on bilingual education and how important it is that the U.S. students not only learn English, but learn one, two, three other languages. The bottom line is, you know, whoever wins, and I'm a Hillary supporter, but at the end of the day, uh, the Democratic Party is going to get back together uh, and, and, and make sure that we get a new president, a Democratic president in November. Well, I think the Democratic Party will come together and the high road is the road to the White House. The Texas primaries have come and gone, and the Republican Party has locked in John McCain as their nominee. No one thought the Democratic race would be unresolved by the time it reached our state in February, and no one thought that the contest would still be up in the air today. We sat down with Texas Secretary of State Phil Wilson to discuss this hectic election year and voting in the Lone Star State. You know, we have 12.7 million registered voters in the state. And every year, our voter participation has typically gone down. And we wanted voters to know their rights, to be involved, to get registered to vote, and regardless of their age, their physical capacity, or their knowledge of the process, be able to participate. And so often, a person may assume they can't take, for example, written notes into the ballot box, or they may have some physical challenges that prohibit them to vote in a traditional sense. So the VoteTexas.org campaign is to know your rights and be involved in the process and to get more and more Texans uh, aware of what they can do to be a voter, to participate and answer those questions. We had a bill pass through the federal government called the Help America Vote Act, HAVA is a shorthand for that. And HAVA funds these outreach activities for voter rights education. A couple of years ago, the Secretary of State's office took it upon themselves to do a campaign across the state educating voters about their rights and how to become involved in the process. We took that to the next level through this recent uh, VoteTexas.org campaign. Get off the couch, go and vote. It doesn't make any difference who you vote for. Well, it does. But exercise your right to democracy. Exercise your right to vote. It's the most wonderful thing in the world that you have. Your freedom of speech. There's nothing to compare with it. Somewhat facetiously, I claim credit that VoteTexas.org drove the turnout to an all-time high. Uh, it probably had a lot more to do with the, well, I know it had a lot more to do with the first time we had a competitive primary in Texas since the 1970s. Uh, you had, particularly the Democrat primary, uh, a very aggressive campaign. Uh, you had candidates here traveling all over the state. You had a lot of money being spent on television and other advertising medium. And so I think the fact that we, man, we thought was a good effort to get people out and informed uh, was significant. But more significant with the kind of turnout we had was the fact you had candidates campaigning. Whenever you have that happen, uh, people's awareness is heightened and they're very interested in the debate and in the process. So I thought it was good for Texas to have that kind of turnout uh, in the primary system for our state, both Democrat and Republican. I would anticipate uh, to have a high turnout in the fall. KLRU docublogger Shane Greb had a camera in hand on primary election night. Here's a docublog he created reflecting the increased voter turnout. Hey. Turnout looks so right, looks good right now. I think it's gonna get crowded, yeah. First Congress, uh, long time voting. It's crowded, stuffy, which is good, I guess. I don't know a lot of people, so it's cool. Is this your, uh, have you voted in this precinct? Yeah. How would you compare this time to the last one? Like tenfold. Really? Yeah, at least. The first time I ever volunteered, the first time the person might have been excited about a presidential candidate. I just want to be a part of it. So I'm just coming out to do my bit. 
Yeah, I've never caucused before. I voted in primaries, but I didn't know about this whole caucus thing until, you know, they did this. Uh, it's more crowded than I've ever seen. I've voted here before. I've never seen this many people here, ever, ever. to be with our neighbors and our, the people who we live next door to every day. Sort of regardless of what happens with the caucus, it's neat to have an opportunity to see the people that we live close to um, all join together. This is the precinct I've been voting in for probably 30 years. Well, how would you compare tonight's turnout to what you've seen in other primaries or general elections? Oh, it's not comparable, I don't think. Tonight is more than I've ever seen before. Why, why do you think that is? I think because it's kind of a historic thing. You've got um, a black running mm -hmm. for African American running for president, and you've got a woman running for president. So I think it's kind of unusual, and people are coming out and, uh, to see the process and, you know, be a part of the history that we're making today. I want to thank everybody for staying tonight. And to give you our numbers, our count for tonight was 373 that caucus tonight. We had 33 that was uh, under uh, 59 that was Clinton, 314, which was Obama. <laughs> Though growth and voter turnout is generally considered to be a positive trend, the Democratic primary was viewed by some as a mixed blessing. The Democratic caucus process created significant challenges and strain across the state. Uh, for example, it's important to realize that the Secretary of State's office and the local election officials do not run the caucus process. It's a party choice, and the party chooses to set the rules both at the primary level and at the caucus level. And in this case, I think there were some challenges to the caucus process, uh, the so-called Texas two-step because of the sheer volume of turnout, perhaps the unanticipated consequences of that, and then also the sense that you had this multi-layered delegate selection process. And so, as the Secretary of State's office, our goal is to have voting be easy and seamless and have high participation rates with voting rights protected. And we hope in the future that all elections, regardless of party selection in the primary system, can be easy. And I hope that the process next time can be more efficient and perhaps more voter friendly and understandable for the average voter to, to participate in. Community docublogger Patricio Espinosa was also out on election night. He submitted this docublog that captures some of the disarray surrounding the Texas two-step. We're in San Antonio, Texas and we are inside a local elementary school. A couple of hundred people here that came in after 7 p.m. Uh, to do the caucusing and whatever that means for different people. What's this uh, thing about uh, this Texas two-stepping that they're talking about? I have no idea. Because you're, uh, you're voting twice? Yeah. Why, what, why is that? Do you understand well, that? Well, one is a vote and the other one is uh, naming delegates. You write down their name, last name, see the zip code, for information, if they have voter registration card, then you put the number here with the address and their choice, which obviously is who? Hillary! Obviously. You put the Hillary? Unless you're voting for Obama. We get the package first, so we do the Hillary first. Once, once we are done, no, that, no, yes. No, no, no. Yes. No, that yes. is not right. We, we, we can do alternate yes. one. Yes. If, no, no, if, no, no, that's if not you right. Want, if you so, so far, we've been here for 30 minutes. Uh, the process is extremely confusing. No one seems to be in charge. There are people here voting, I guess, on the floor, on the ground. See, this is my first time too. I'm trying to be as uh, go by the book. I'm not trying to go by myself. I'm trying to go by the book, make it as organized as I can. You know, and I need some help. What do you have in your hand? 
Um, I have here an envelope for 41110. What's inside of it? I have no idea. What does it say? Attention chairs. Let's see. Let's read it. Read it. Attention chairs. Say? The precinct convention may not start, including signing in, until every voter has finished voting, even if it's very late. The decision was made by D TDP Chair Boyd Ritchie in conjunction with both the Clinton and Obama national campaigns. And do you know what that means? I have zero idea. Basically, we're here until it's all said and done. Put this, put this in this place. Hold on, guys. I need to organize. I'm just trying to find out right now if they've got a one lines for uh, Hillary and one lines for Obama. Okay. We're going to sign. I got my papers. We're going to sign the whole thing. And here we go. First, you're supposed to write your name. Then it's asking you for your address. In San Antonio, Texas, zip code. It's asking for an email address. Now it's asking for my voter registration number. That's it. Now we go home and find out. <laughs> oh, we have to show it to the to the judge here or the uh, the captain. He's gonna verify uh, the ID and make sure everything is okay. And you're next, ma'am. And sir, we're done. So I'm gonna go home and watch CNN so you can tell us what the final resorts are. Okay? And this is Patricio Espinosa in San Antonio, Texas. There will probably be help. We are very fortunate that our 254 counties, our county election administrators, our technologists, our partners with IBM at Heart and Civic, it all worked, both in the voter registration side and the day of the election. And so the concerns we had going into the election were that it wouldn't be about the results the next day. It would be about breakdowns in technology. It would be about problems with uh, the election system working. And we were, we were very well prepared. We ran a lot of stress tests. Uh, we put our, our system through the paces. Our partners did a good job of being prepared. And so I think it's always incumbent upon this office and the counties across the state to be ready and to not take anything for granted. Every so often, watching candidates sojourn on the road to the presidency becomes a national affair. At the end of the day, what's really important isn't who you vote for or why, but that you were motivated to go out and vote, period. Going forward, we hope to run a great election in November. Uh, first and foremost, that's our constitutional obligation. The, one of the many brilliant things about our country and the Founding Fathers, they developed a system that worked. And it's worked for more than 200 years. The first step to becoming a docublogger is logging onto our website at klru.org slash docubloggers. Exchange your insights and opinions with your community on our blog, watch stories from our broadcasts, view web-only extras, and even add your own docublogs. Find all this and more at klru.org slash docubloggers. Described as divisive and inefficient, the political process is often portrayed in a negative light. But behind the scenes, legislators are solving the problems of the American people with compromise and cooperation. There is nothing in life that isn't political in some form or fashion. Political parties are what you make of them. This government is what you make of it. The government is only as good as the people who are involved in it. Learning politics is learning how to exist in, in society in today's life. I get here at the Capitol about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, which
which means I have to leave pretty early. I start by coming in this office, kind of getting lay of the land, what our schedule is for the day. On the Appropriations Committee, we start committee meetings fairly early in the morning. All the bills are referred by the speaker to their respective okay. committees, and whatever committees you're assigned to that you sit on, you spend a lot of time listening to testimony, hearing bills, having bills introduced by your colleagues uh, to the committee, voting on those bills. If you're not in a committee meeting, you'll have meetings with constituents, meeting with uh, people on different issues coming in this office, and that will last usually till about six, seven o'clock. The bulk of the time you spend on the floor, either debating or waiting or working or whatever it is, on the floor is toward the middle and later part of the session. There are some days, though, that our committee meetings go till two, three, four in the morning. And those are the long nights, and those are when the very contested bills that have 150, 200, 250 amendments to them and all the back and forth there, you get a lot of time on your seat in the floor. It's fun, though. You cannot ignore the other side. The Democrats cannot ignore the Republicans in the crafting their legislation. The Republicans cannot completely ignore the Democrats in crafting their legislation, nor should they. And people, you know, God help us, see things, sometimes the same thing, very differently. And that's a strength for us, not a, not a weakness, I think. And our democracy should honor those differences and respect them. Each and everything that we do in life is affected by the political process and it's affected in some form or fashion by the legislature. The classes that you take in high school. What kind of schools you have. What your requirements are to graduate. How much you pay in tuition. Your job opportunities in the future. We have a decision to make as a state right now and in the next five to ten years about whether or not we're going to truly invest in our institutions of higher learning. Those decisions are driven partly by our university heads and by our business community, but primarily our legislature needs to, to wake up to the awareness of the connection between higher education and our economy. The kids of Texas don't compete against the kids from New York or California. They compete against the kids from Asia and India and China and all the other countries around the world. As you sit in your high school classroom and you think about how much it's going to cost for college, or where you're going to go to college, and how good a school UT or A&M or Texas Tech or Texas State is, as you think through those things, as I did uh, a few years ago, don't ev ever underestimate the importance of you calling your legislator. Every law that ever went into effect over there on that floor was because of somebody went to their legislator, their senator, somewhere to fix that problem, and got it through this process. Ninety percent of them are from people that back in my district that have recognized a problem and recognized a solution to it and said, Dan, would you carry it? Would you help me get this passed? People can influence the process much easier than they think by picking up the phone or walking into an office as a legislator to sell that program, to sell the, the priority of higher education to the legislature. It takes grassroots support from people. My greatest challenge probably in public office, I think, is um, keeping perspective sometimes. And I think it's probably every politician's uh, biggest challenge, if they'll admit it. What happens is you get up here in this capital and it becomes a bubble. Uh, and everybody tells you how smart you are and you know how great you are and oh, you did so wonderful at this. and. Um, if you have good friends that tell you that you really aren't that smart and uh, you really didn't look that great <laughs> that deal, you're in a whole lot better position. Because when you start believing those things, uh, that's when you get in trouble. And I think that's the biggest challenge. Politics is, is not a perfect uh, profession. It's an important one. I think more uh, good people, honest people, moderate people need to be involved in it. A docublog is a video that tells a story about a person, place, event, or anything else in your community. It can be funny, serious, concrete, or avant-garde. We encourage you to go out there and share your story with your neighbors. 
go to klru.org slash docubloggers to find out how.